Mr. Zimmerman, yes, sir. you're appearing here for your first appearances, our first appearance at this time for charge of murder in the second degree, and you are represented by Mr. Romero. Is that true? Yes, sir. Zimmerman confronted Martin with those three words taken from the affidavit submitted today by the special prosecutor's office. Angela Corey's team of prosecutors will build their case against George Zimmerman, the man who killed 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. But that affidavit could be the last document in the case to be made public after both the prosecution and defense obtained an order from the judge sealing future filings in the case. A bail hearing has not yet been scheduled. Zimmerman's next scheduled court appearance is May 29th. Here's George Zimmerman's lawyer, Mark O'Mara, explaining why he did not request bail today. It just didn't make sense with where the case is now, with my client's status, and quite honestly, with the attempt to truly calm this day case down rather than demand a presentation of evidence which might only increase the fervor around the case. Joining me now are Natalie Jackson, co-counsel for the Martin family, and Charles M. Blow, a New York Times columnist. Uh, I want to play for you something that uh, Trayvon's mother said today on the Today Show that got a little bit of uh, an exchange going uh, about this case today. Let's listen to what she said. I believe it was an accident. I, I believe that uh, it just got out of control, and he couldn't turn the clock back. And then after the hearing this morning, uh, Mark O'Mara, Zimmerman's lawyer, was asked by one of the reporters if he would use that statement somehow against uh, the parents of Trayvon Martin, the notion that it was an accident instead of a murder. Let's listen to how the attorney responded to that. They went through a horrible tragedy. They lost their son. But we're not going to be talking about using words against the mother of a deceased child. But we're not doing that. Natalie Jackson, uh, there certainly is a new lawyer in this case, as we said yesterday, as demonstrated by that response. Uh, could you expand for us uh, what uh, Trayvon's mother meant by what she was saying this morning? Sure. We had a discussion this morning after that, and she really meant that had not George, had not George Zimmerman and Trayvon ever had an encounter, the encounter was accidental. That's what started this whole thing, this whole series of events. So she was talking about the fact that they encountered one another at all on February 26th. So, I, you know, I think that people kind of took it and ran with it, the statement. Yeah, I want to I wanna now dig into this affidavit today because it's short, uh, but it is, I think, very revealing on, of the prosecutor's case. Begins by saying Zimmerman observed Martin and assumed Martin was a criminal. So she has gone into his state of mind about what he was thinking there. Uh, she says, uh, during the recorded call, Zimmerman made reference to people he felt had committed and gotten away with break-ins. Uh, she determines, the, the prosecutor has determined that one of the things he said on that uh, 911 audio tape uh, after saying, you know, these people, this, slur, this you know, word I can't say on TV, they always get away with this stuff. And then he also said these effing punks. Uh, Charles Blow, uh, the prosecutor seems to have determined uh, that it's the word punks as opposed to the specific racial slur word many of us uh, have thought we've heard on that tape. Right. So th that's one of the, the only kind of points of clarification that you get in this very short affidavit. In fact, you know, I, 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 you know I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. Uh, I'm just a reader of this. It just seems really, really, really thin. Uh, doesn't move the ball very much. In fact, you know, there, there are pieces in there where you want to just know how things were determined. For instance, uh, they say that, uh, you know, Trayvon's mother identified his voice. You know, one would want them to have the kind of forensic uh, voice analysis information to say we have determined using scientific methods. Of course, you know, my heart goes out to the, you know, Mrs. Fulton and loss of her son. And, you know, she hears something. Joy Zimmerman's father says he heard, he hears his own son as well. You would want to have that cleared up. We hope that the prosecutor's office has that scientific information and can advance the ball and that we're not stuck with this kind of very thin 
feeling information because it seems like that would kind of weaken a case, particularly if you're going for a second degree man, uh, a sec second degree murder case. Uh, Natalie, what I'm struck by in this affidavit is that it completely and totally accepts your version of the interpretation of the evidence all the way through. Uh, this affidavit asserts that Martin was on the phone with a friend, the girlfriend. This affidavit accepts her testimony completely. The witness had, uh, had said that Martin was scared because he was being followed. Uh, it goes on to every piece of this evidence that we've analyzed on this show. The prosecutor has accepted the interpretation uh, that is most uh, harmful and dismissive of Zimmerman's claims. Uh, the police dispatch realized Zimmerman was pursuing Martin. He instruct, instructed him not to do that. Zimmerman disregarded the police. And then, of course, finally, Zimmerman confronted Martin. Uh, it is, I think uh, you can assume and I can assume that the prosecutor has more evidence than we are aware of to support each one of those sentences. And, and as Charles has pointed out, surely he got the mother's testimony, but the prosecutors did, but obviously they will not rely exclusively on that, back that up with more. No. Uh, Everything no, we're and I, and, and I just want to make one other point, which is everything we're hearing in here about witnesses, they are all ear witnesses. There isn't a single eyewitness who is quoted in this affidavit. Right. There's something called prosecutorial ethics. This prosecutor, when she wrote that affidavit, trust that she had enough evidence to back up every sentence that she had in that affidavit. There's been a question of whether or not she overcharged. And uh, with the ethics that the prosecutors have, she has, to, she has to believe that she can prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. So when we talk about, you know, the, the statements that are made as far as Trayvon's mother identifying a voice, you know, you, you better believe she's got some evidence that can back that up. Yeah, I, I mean, as and, we'll and that's see in stuff the, that we don't know yet. As we'll see in the trial, virtually every one of these sentences is going to represent a half a day or a day of trial. Uh, there's a lot more behind every one of them. I'm just struck that every single uh, assertion in this affidavit is exactly, Natalie, as you and the supporters of Trayvon Martin have presented and interpreted the evidence here on this show and elsewhere. Uh, we have run out of time for tonight. I'm very sorry. Charles M. Blow and Natalie Jackson, thank you both very much for joining me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. In the rewrite tonight, the man who wrote the California death penalty now wants to repeal it. And later, the latest anti-Semitic ravings of Mel Gibson, according to a screenwriter who says he's heard Mel Gibson say beyond the worst things you can possibly imagine someone saying about Jewish people. And this screenwriter also says he's heard Mel Gibson talking about a plot to murder Gibson's former girlfriend, the mother of his child. Mel Gibson, that's coming up.